Good day. I appreciate you tuning in to our Home Talk series again. It's a blessing to be able to come into your place of business or into your home or, or wherever you may be at uh, this moment of time. I was pondering on what I would speak to you about today, but in the days that uh, are getting longer and the weather is warming up somewhat, uh, we see a lot of people that are planting gardens. Uh, you go by some of these stores and you see them carrying out plants and fertilizers and other things and they plan on making a garden this year. I myself am also interested in making a garden this year and I've been looking at some videos, I've been reading books, uh, and uh, just trying to decide what I'm going to plant this year. With that in mind upon my heart, uh, I began to look through the Word of God and there are several Bible gardens that are mentioned in the Scripture. Three of them I'm going to bring to your attention today, and I want you to listen to me. Uh, if you're accustomed to taking notes, I trust that you'll get your paper and pen and uh, be ready to take these verses down and maybe write down some things that will be a blessing to you in the days to come. I enjoy going to gardens. I enjoy going down to the Callaway Gardens. Uh, I enjoy going to Gibbs Garden and seeing the beautiful uh, plants and all that they've planted there. Just uh, a few days ago, the wife and I walked through the Hamilton Gardens over in Towns County, and the rhododendron were just simply beautiful uh, as we were able to walk through those gardens. Uh, I'm going to mention three gardens that are found in the scripture, uh, and uh, I trust that they'll be a blessing to you. Um, before the Lord ever made a plant, uh, or before he ever made the earth, uh, uh, there was no rain. Uh, there was no way to uh, really do anything in a garden. And so we realize that in the beginning, there was what was known as the Garden of Death. Uh, and in Genesis chapter number 2, I'm going to read there in verses number 8 down through verses number 10. And it simply reads like this. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that was pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. I'm sure that this was a very beautiful garden that God created in the beginning. I would have liked to have walked through that garden uh, and seen all the various things that the Lord put there, just how he had it laid out. Uh, now, if you've been born again, I think you'll see a garden again one day that will be as beautiful as the Garden of Eden and maybe even much more so uh, than that garden. Now, we realize that this first garden was the home of a man by the name of Adam. And uh, he had a helpmate uh, uh, by the name of Eve. Uh, when God placed him in that garden, or when he put Adam in that garden, he instructed him on what he wanted him to do. Now, I believe that Adam was given a will, and I think he was given the privilege of exercising that will. He was not a puppet on a string, uh, but he was a free moral agent. Uh, and in Genesis 2, 15, 16, and 17, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, 
For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. God made the instructions very clear. And then sometime after Adam had received those instructions, uh, in Genesis 2, verses 21 and 22, it says, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. This woman that we refer to as Eve, I understand was never called Eve in the Garden of Eden. She was called Ishai, which means my lover. Now, I think Adam had a, a beautiful wife, uh, and I think uh, that Eve had a perfect husband. Now, I know that's kind of hard for maybe some of you ladies to uh, understand, but she did. One thing about this whole uh, deal was uh, Eve could never say to Adam, you're acting like your father. And Adam could never say to Eve, you're acting like your mother, because these were man and woman that God had formed. Now, we realize uh, when Satan came on the scene in that first garden, we realize uh, that he approached the woman uh, and he deceived her into thinking that she could disregard God's warnings unto Adam. As you read on in the story, we know that Eve ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and Adam ate of that same garden. We really don't know what they ate, but it said that they saw their nakedness, and they sewed fig leaves together and tried to hide their nakedness. Uh, God came on the scene, and we know that he killed some animals uh, in order to make them coats of skin. We're not told what kind of animals that God killed. Uh, I kind of believe that maybe it was a lamb, because later on, we know that Abel, their son, was instructed to bring a lamb as a sacrifice to the Lord. And so God killed them, and, we, and he clothed them. But on the day that they ate thereof, the Bible says that they died. Now, they did not die physically, but they died spiritually, and uh, every time I go into my garden to work, uh, I'm reminded uh, of what God said unto Adam. I go there to pull weeds uh, and to sweat. Uh, I presume maybe before they fell, uh, there was no weeds to pull. There was no sweat that came upon the body. But uh, so the garden here became a garden of death, uh, Later on, we know that Cain will rise up and kill his brother Abel and bury him in the ground. So that first garden became a garden of tragedy. And what a tremendous price mankind has had to pay for that one moment of disobedience there in the garden. And then the second garden that I want to mention to you today uh, is a garden of triumph. Uh, some 4,000 years later on, uh, someone planted another garden. This garden is known as the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus uh, went to the Garden of Gethsemane often uh, to pray. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 18, verses 1 and 2, it said, When Jesus had spoken these words, uh, he went forth with his disciples so over the brook Kidron, uh, 
where was a garden, into which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oftentimes went there with his disciples. It was in this garden that the second Adam, or I say the last Adam, ransomed what the first Adam lost in the Garden of Eden. In Romans chapter number 5, verse number 19, it says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. <coughs> Excuse me. This pollen has really taken its toll upon a lot of people, including myself. Uh, when, that, when, the, when Satan entered the first garden, which was Eden, uh, he came as the shining one, the cunning one. <clears throat> when the devil entered the second garden, uh, he did not try to hide his true identity. Uh, he knew there was no need for him to try to hide his true nature from the, he could not hide his true nature from the one whom he was to meet in Gethsemane. And so the struggle was on. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember the story that he asked his disciples to pray with him. It says that he went a little further on than where the disciples were, and he was there praying. I think the devil would love to have destroyed Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible tells us that Jesus prayed in such agony in the Garden of Gethsemane that his sweat became as great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And we know that on this night when Judas and his band of men came seeking the Lord Jesus. Uh, they came with their swords, their spears, probably their torches, uh, and uh, they were looking for Jesus. Uh, they come into the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, and Jesus confronted them and said unto them, uh, uh, What is it that you want, or who are you seeking? And uh, they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, and Jesus responded by saying, I am. And when he responded in that matter, the scriptures tells us that the men fell back to the ground just at the sound of his name, I am. And uh, so we know here that they came they arrested the Lord Jesus. Uh, they took him away. They took him and they tried him. They mocked him. They beat upon him. And then later on, they put uh, the cross upon him and he carried that cross uh, up to Mount Calvary. And it's there that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to die on the cross of Calvary. These religious rulers uh, were fighting a battle that they had already lost, uh, and they could not win by simply nailing Jesus to a cross. Uh, they did not know at this time that they were opening the door of salvation to whosoever will uh, that can come uh, and accept the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as personal Savior. So I think one of the greatest victories of all eternity uh, was won there in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden of Triumph. And then we have another garden that is mentioned. I call this the Garden of Life. Uh, the Garden of Life is located uh, very near the second garden, this Garden of Gethsemane. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 19, there in verse number 41, 
It says, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein never man yet laid. In the Gospel of Matthew, we learn that the new sepulcher belonged to a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph. You can read about that in Matthew 27. Some believe that Joseph was the owner of the entire garden. I don't know. He may have been. But anyway, Joseph is going to bury Jesus in the new tomb, which had been cut out in the rock. And we know that when he was placed inside that tomb, that there was a large rock stone that was rolled into the doorway of the tomb where Jesus was buried. And we know that a seal was put upon that because Jesus had testified that he was going to rise again. And so out of fear, we know that the religious leaders, the Pharisees, thought that there would be a possibility maybe of his disciples coming and stealing his body from the tomb and then declaring there had been a, a resurrection. And so they put that seal there. We know that the soldiers came. They sent soldiers out there and they were to guard the tomb to make sure that no one uh, robbed the tomb of Jesus' body. I've often wondered what the conversation was about the, during those days and nights that the soldiers were there looking and watching and guarding. I'm sure maybe not a loud talk, but maybe a whisper. And they were wondering what was going on. So we know here that uh, for three days and three nights, uh, nothing happened. And then the Bible says, uh, after that time, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 28, there in verse number 2, uh, let me read to you what it says there. It says, There was a great earthquake, uh, and the angel came down. And I believe it says, The angel of the Lord, and rolled the stone away, and then sat upon it. Now, he did not roll the stone away to let Jesus out, but he rolled the stone away that Peter and John and Mary uh, and Mary Magdalene and the other Mary could see inside the tomb. In verse 3 and 4 of that same chapter, it says that this angel of the Lord, his countenance was like lightning, and his raiment was white as snow, and for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. We know that very early in that morning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came near the tomb uh, to finish up the in, uh, embalming of the body. Uh, and we know there in verses number 5 and 6, when they got to the tomb, they saw this angel of the Lord. And this angel of the Lord said unto them, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified, he is not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come and see the place where the Lord lay. Now the story goes on. We know that uh, these ladies uh, run to tell the disciples about what they saw, what they had heard. And we know that Peter and John comes running to the tomb to discover that it's empty. Now, there's no one like Jesus who was willing to lay down his life uh, for lost mankind and rise again to die no more. If you remember when he was born, he borrowed a uh, manger, manger in which to be laid in. And then some years later, uh, he borrowed a donkey to ride in to the city of Jerusalem. And now he has barred a tomb uh, in which to be buried in. And we know here uh, that uh, this tomb 
is going to be returned to its owner uh, as good as new. Jesus is not going to be in there but just a few days. Now, as we look at these gardens and this message, we know that death was born in a garden. Life was swallowed up in death in the Garden of Eden. And then we know that death was conquered in a garden. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus battled with him who had the power of death. Uh, read what it says in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 2, verses 14 and 15. And we know that uh, he took for him the keys of death and hell. Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 18. So life everlasting appeared in a garden. Death was swallowed up in life uh, when our Lord rose from the dead. And now every born-again child of God can shout, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But there's another garden. And one day, uh, we who are born again are going to enter that garden uh, that is mentioned in Revelation chapter number 22. Now, did you know that the word paradise, the word paradise means a garden of love. So when we die, even in this walk of life, we go to a place known as paradise. We go to a place known as the garden of love. So it's a place that is beautiful. I don't think uh, that man has ever saw a garden like the garden of paradise. Uh, so it's a blessing to be able to know that one day when this life is finished, uh, that uh, we can go to this place. Have you ever realized that you were born in sin? All are sinners by nature. The Bible talks about the wages of sin is death. Uh, and there is no spiritual life apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but uh, face it, and in true repentance, with a sincere faith, uh, why don't you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and ask Jesus to come into your life? And the Lord Jesus will come and save you and write your name in the Lamb's book of life. In Romans chapter 10, verse number 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you will have a right to that glorious paradise which the Lord Jesus Christ has prepared for all who love him. I see my time has gone this day, and so I trust if maybe you've decided to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior, why don't you tell somebody, or why don't you call us here at the church, 706-835-1449. Uh, and just on the answer machine, give us your name, your information that you've accepted Christ as Savior, and maybe you'd like to talk to someone, and we'll try to return your call and try to get in touch with you concerning this. So I trust that this has been a blessing to you today. We'll pray for you, and you pray for us if you will. Let me close with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful today for the opportunity to mention these gardens. Uh, we're grateful that life started in a garden, and we know one day when this life is finished, uh, we'll go to this place that God has created for us. Uh, such a marvelous place that is mentioned there in the book of the Revelation. Things that our eyes uh, have never seen. I think it will be a wonderful place. And uh, what a joy it's going to be. And we will receive new glorified bodies to be able to enjoy this garden that God has created for us. Uh, I do pray for those that are out there, maybe that are listening, that one that's never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. I pray today that they will repent of their sins, invite Jesus to come into their life, and, and maybe they'll give us a call or they'll talk to somebody about their salvation experience. Uh, Thank you for what you're going to do now. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you and may God bless you.